DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Sally Reed, who's the author of Night's Bright Darkness, a modern conversion story, as well as three books of poetry. She is a poet in residence with a hermitage of three holy hierarchs, and she lives with her family near Rome. With Sally Reed, we go inside the pages of Annunciation, A Call to Faith in a Broken World, published by Ignatius Press. Sally, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here. I love Annunciation, A Call to Faith in a Broken World. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for bringing it forward. Well, thank you to you. I mean, I'm delighted. It was something I kind of had to do. (laughs) You had to do it, I guess, as a response as a parent who was trying to pass on the faith to her child. In that regard, yeah, you had to do it. But to be able to share it with the rest of us now, that that's where it becomes a gift. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Well, it's yeah, it was something that, yes, it's strange, isn't it? Because it, it really is written as a letter to my daughter. But at the same time, as a writer, you always have that in your head that this is needs to be something well done and well and kind of deep. You know, I knew that it was something that she had to be able to read as as an as a grown up, and it had to be something really well formed. And actually, the form and everything just came to me from out of nowhere, if you like. It wasn't like I decided one day to write a book about the Annunciation. It just seemed to all fall into place. I think you hit on something that's very important. I think it organically came from you. I mean, this is who you are, and this is how you can relate and talk with your child and by expressing what's deep down inside of you. And I think that's all any parent is asked to do, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And I I think the the lovely thing about it was that I really, I really did write it for her because she's a, you know, everyone's a unique person and she's got very specific needs, but we share so much commonality in the sense that we're all, we all love, we're all created to love God. And but the nice thing was, as I was writing it, I would if I was having a crisis of my own, I would be lying in bed thinking, oh, I should remember what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, that's a good sign. You know, at least it's for two of us. <laughs> yes, I think that's the value of sacred scripture, isn't it? It's like sometimes when we forget, let's let's yeah. grab it and remind ourselves. Yeah, because we're all in a constant state of forgetting. I mean, I, I know I am. I just feel like, you know, we pray and we're, we're as faithful as we can be. But it's a process of we, we always have to keep bringing ourselves back because we, you know, we are fallen. Well, what I love about this book so much is that for anyone who has uh, come alive in their relationship with God in their faith life, that there's sometimes we think, Oh, because I have this great epiphany, as it were, and now I say yes, and I embrace all of this into my life, that we think that moment is going to seal the deal forever. And yet Mm. we are challenged. We are, there are are going to be those moments, these ebbs and flows where we're just not always sure of what it is that we believe or how we believe. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, And that's something I really wanted to cover was that, you know, we are you know, many of us are gifted with with amazing feelings, if you like, about with God in prayer, and he communicates to us in very blunt, sometimes ways. And of course, the the prime example of that is Mary in the Annunciation. But we're all, if you like, we all go through our own little Annunciations all the time. But then at the same time, um, people go through years of, of the dark night where there's there's kind of nothing to really go on. And you're really walking in trust, and you're walking in faith. But by tradition, we do believe that of Mary, that we, we know we aren't told of anything else in scripture that she that she went through. And primarily, she's an example of faith and trust. And I, I always see her as this most courageous of women. I mean, w- when I was an atheist, I saw Mary, um, at least I saw the depiction of her that was presented in the church as kind of simpering and and weak. And when I became a believer, I realized that actually she's incredibly courageous. I mean, the most courageous woman in history, I would say, and also the most powerful woman in history, because, you know, she's closest to God, um, you know, of all, of all uh, created mortal beings. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so it's about trust and it's about faith. And then it's about the fact that we, everybody, I assume, goes through these points in their life where prayer is difficult. And, um, you know, as I say in the final chapter, and the angel departed from her. 
when we are, we suddenly feel left alone. And although we're not alone, you know, we have those feelings as people who, who are fallen. I am delighted to be able to talk to you again about this particular book, because when we first spoke about your initial work, Night's Bright Darkness, a modern conversion story, which was published by Ignatius Press just a few years ago, that probably was one of the most beautiful modern tellings of a conversion story that I've read. And when we got to meet each other in Rome, I could see, wow, this is, you know, it's real. She's, she's not making this up. It's very <laughs> authentic. And I mean that in all sincerity. With this particular work, I think the, I, I hate to say it this way, the Mary issue is one of the most challenging because it's, it's difficult, as you said, when you see maybe from the outside, you see somebody who who didn't have a choice or simpering or, or whatever that might be. I wonder why Mary is the one that seems to be such a challenge. Yeah, I think for, from the outside, Mary can seem weak, which is such a fundamental mistake if for the, in the non-believing camp. And then I think that in the Protestant camp, um, they sometimes, without putting words into people's mouths, they might see the uh, devotion we have to Mary and, and mistake it for worship. So that's another tricky one. And I think speaking personally, coming from an atheist perspective, my relationship with Mary, it's always felt like she's really been there, like she's always been at my shoulder and at my side. And the way I related to her at the very beginning was very much as a woman. I was really, I've always been very interested in her, in her maternity. And um, I, I love considering how she would have undergone, you know, being a Mary to being a mother to to the young Jesus, because you know, in a sense, you know, what, what a nightmare. <laughs> well, <have> been. <laughs> yeah. Talk about challenges. It, it's yeah. a different kind, yeah. isn't it? Because, you know, children are always, it's so difficult being a mother. And if there are differences with your child or you have to be different in any way, that's always difficult. And obviously she went through that and she went through more. So I, I've always looked at, you know, my own kind of um, my own humanity and then looked at Mary's humanity and taking great inspiration from her. So I think that with this book, it, uh, you know, I think probably it's a very grounded look at Mary. I look at, you know, very closely with scripture and, and with what her womanhood was like. Um, and I have a great devotion to her, but that's kind of where I'm from, you know. The, the premise for the book, as you, as you indicated earlier, essentially a response or a letter to your daughter. And Flo, she was three years old when you experienced your great conversion, that conversion and your eventually entrance into the church. And now she is about to receive her first communion. And yeah. what you experienced is what many, many, many parents experience. But the thing about Flo is she's pretty frank. She just comes straight out and tell you. <laughs> Most kids kind of hold this in. You've raised up a, a kid who's not afraid to speak her mind. Oh, absolutely. She's very feisty indeed. And and she's always she's always loved to thrash out the theological points, <laughs> you know, even as a very young child. And and I think that um I think we underestimate children because I think they want to be told the truth. And and Mary, you know, a Fatima, Mary really told the truth to those three children. And and I think I've always been very frank with her. And so therefore she was with me. And so she you know, she suddenly said, Gosh, I, I don't know if I can do it because I think I want the party more than I want communion. And and in fairness to her, she was looking also at my conversion and my passion, and she was saying, "Well, that that's not me. I, I I don't feel that." And so it was a question of saying, "Well, you don't have to feel anything, you know, and you don't have to have any clever arguments. You just have to open the door. It's just it's your it's just saying yes." And so that's that's where the whole, whole kind of idea came from. But it, but I started writing the book later, and because through the years she kept on with. Um, well, you know, why does why do I have to go to mass? My friends don't go. You, you know, I, I believe in God. Why would I need to go to mass? And it was kind of getting difficult. And I began to see that, you know, when she reaches 16, I won't be able to physically drag her to mass. And I thought there was a reasonable chance that she might stop going. And so I thought to myself, well, I want to I want to write down now while the issues are fresh in my mind you know, what her reservations are and how she is and kind of really try and make a case so that when she's older, she can always go back to the book and see why I think it's so important. Um, so I, I finished writing the book just after she'd had her um, confirmation. And and it was amazing because I, I sort of turned around once I finished the book and looked at her. And it was that phase 
that I suppose mothers will be aware, aware of when I say this, where you just realize that in a very few weeks, they've just grown up. Mm-hmm. And and it's just so quick and it's so amazing. And, and But I also truly believe that writing the book um, was a prayer and that it was also my, my, my prayers were being answered. And suddenly I had to go to, away to Ireland for the weekend and leave her with her dad. And I thought, oh, well, she won't go to mass, but I won't make a big fuss about it. Um, and when I came home, um, my husband said, well, Sunday morning, she was knocking at my door saying, out of bed, take me to mass. <laughs> don't, make, <laughs> don't make me be late, you know. And uh-huh. so there was this incredible change that, that I really attribute to the book because I don't and the confirmation. I, I don't see that's just such a, an amazing turnaround. And she still will say, oh, the mass is so boring. <laughs> you know? yeah. But she'll go. She she won't say I'm not going to go. Ah. Uh. Yeah, to the book, to the mass, uh, can we bring it down to grace? Came down to yeah. grace, didn't it? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it, I don't want anybody to think that this is a kid's book. I don't want it because no. it was written as a letter to your daughter. But it, because this is, honest to goodness, Sally, this is the best of meditation and contemplation. It all wrapped up in Lexio. I mean, this is what it looks like. Uh-huh. And you have been able to put it down. And I, what was incredible was that you anticipated what your daughter's questions, what her concerns are, but it all came out of you. Yeah. What yeah. a dance you were doing with the Holy Spirit there. Well, yeah, I tell you. And I, <laughs> and I think I remember, you know, sitting on this very sofa, suddenly having this image of the Annunciation in my head, because I've always been really obsessed with that particular scene, even as an atheist. I always, I wrote poems about the Annunciation, and it's just such a powerful encounter. And I suddenly could see how the Annunciation was this dance, which is why I'm telling you this, because you say dance. And it is this kind of God coming to her as he comes to all of us. And then this kind of sorting out of who I am, you know, I'm the handmaid of the Lord and and what shall I do, you know, be it done to me according to your word. And then the angel going, and it's this amazing movement that I could see kind of like an S shape. And, and I think that I, as I say, my daughter and I are quite similar in many ways and that we're very passionate, but I think this is shared by all humanity. Ultimately, the reason that we um, become addicted, get depressed, get broken hearted, pursue the wrong path, all of those things are because we we're not giving ourselves enough to God. And um, although I'm very careful when I talk about mental health issues, because it's a it's an illness mm-hmm. and it can plague the best of us. And, you know, it should be considered with men, with physical illness as a kind of a thing we can offer up to God. Um, but nevertheless, like all these things that kind of plague us in our lives, we it's because we need God. This is all about us needing to turn to God and only he can satisfy us. So that's why with my daughter, when she'd, you know, freak out or have a meltdown, I just could see in my head, oh, my goodness, <laughs> she, before she hits her teens, she has to put God in that place in her heart. Yeah, how, do, how incredible that you'd be brought to the Annunciation. I mean, I think sometimes... And I and I say this in all reverence to everyone's experience. So I and I and, and again, I'm trying to say this delicately. I think we underrate the power of the Annunciation. I mean, we we celebrate Bethlehem and we celebrate Christmas and Easter and Easter, of course, that is the the pinnacle of it all. But the Annunciation, this is the moment. This is where God breaks into our humanity in such an incredible way, the door had to be opened by this yes. And yeah. so Nazareth becomes this incredible spot, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And and I say in, in the book, when I when I got to writing the book, I, I started, you know, really delving into scripture to see how people reacted to angels, you know, throughout the Bible. Mm-hmm. And the reaction is mostly one of, you know, terror or absolute awe, or, you know, they throw themselves to the ground and, you know, they're shivering and shaking and they fall over. And Mary's reaction is so very different. And it's right after Zachariah's reaction when he literally falls to the ground and is terrified. And um, it's the same angel. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. And Mary just, it's this moment where God is suddenly relating to us in a different way. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful. And that's why um, actually the, the cover of the book, I'm so pleased that they chose this picture, this particular Annunciation, which is the Fra Angelical, because the angel is just kind of, you know, bowing down to Mary, sort of saying, shh, you know, I've got something to tell you. And Mary's kind of put her head down, too. But it's like they're sharing a secret. Mm. And there really is this sort of collaboration going on. And and in that moment, 
you know, she receives Christ physically. And then because of that, we can receive Christ physically in the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is like our little mini Annunciation. Mm, beautiful. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Sally Reed about her book, Annunciation, A Call to Faith in a Broken World. I love it, love it, love it. For what it's worth, I think the particular chapter on Do Not Be Afraid is one of the most important chapters I've read in so long. I think the world needs to hear that right now, Sally. Do not be afraid. Everybody hones in on that chapter, do not be afraid. It's true. We're very prey to fear. I think especially in, in ironically, in kind of the developed Western world, we're very prey to anxiety. It's a real problem. And, and it's good to take a good hard look at suffering when you've got a daughter like mine who asks the hard questions, um, which, is what, which is why I looked at some very difficult sort of stories in that book, some true stories about, you know, the death of children and and that kind of thing. Again, as I said earlier, I think this is the best combination of what happens when meditatio and contemplatio meet, and it's all anchored and reflecting on the word, the Lexio Divina of it all. Mm -hmm. Because what you've, you've done here is you haven't taken it each verse in that enunciation scene. You've taken particular, the power of those words, every word means something, because it's in there. But in the ones that you've chosen, you've not only meditated and put us in the scene, but then you contemplated and also reflected on stories from your own life. The ones you share about your great grandmother and the great aunt and the crippling effects that you don't want your daughter to go down that road, yeah. you don't, not to live yeah. a lifetime trapped in those experiences. Yeah. And I think that's something about, you know, the mass and about prayer that when we have grief and I, you know, I hate to sound like I know, like I'm an expert in these things, but I think I've seen so many instances of, of terrible grief and it's interesting how people react. And it's interesting how with faith, God gives us with the mass, particularly God gives us this chance to place everything on the altar and for all time to be present you know, so we can actually put our grief into Christ's fresh wounds and we can actually keep our grief healthy 
without becoming stuck because the, the problem with um with neurosis which is what things tend turn out to be in the end is when we get, get stuck in things and we can't move on and um of course it's trite to say move on from a death mm-hmm. but the point is if we give god our grief then we can move on because god is keeping it for us and it won't go away you know he'll keep it but he'll keep it fresh because christ's wounds are fresh you know nothing nothing is stale everything is kept present in god um so yeah it was things like that like i i, I thought it was very important especially with teenagers um the, the way the stories you hear these days about teenagers going into depression and suicide and all that stuff um it's something that i turn to a lot as an ex-psychiatric nurse i'm sort of always talking to her about the big issues and how you know if we give things to god then that can only help and how time always always moves us along like never think a day is so bad that you can't get through it i uh, heard a recent study that there have been, you know, moments in human uh, history, we get to a certain point where we live into our 80s, which is an unheard of in the human condition. But there are times when it begins to decrease. And they saw that back in 1918, because of the actual age of man started to decrease because of not only the war, World War One, but also because of the Spanish influenza and, and a number of other factors. Well, we're seeing that again now for the first time in all wow. these years. And Sally, it's not because of war and it's not because of a physical pandemic. It's the, what they call death by despair. The number yeah. of people that are, especially the young, that are taking their own lives, those who have chronic illnesses, or the death by opioids or drug addictions, be trying to escape. And they actually give it the category death by despair. I mean, it's yeah. tragic, isn't it? It's really tragic. And when you hear about these cases, there was the case, I think, of a girl in, in Belgium who um, wanted to die and was euthanized, and she was in her teens. And she was chronically depressed and she'd been abused and and they they let her be euthanized. Um, and I just wondered, you know, if anybody had said to her, you know, God loves you. You know, I just wonder. I don't know, of course, but um, I, I think it's just so important that I know that still now when I put my daughter to bed, you know, the last thing she hears is always when, when we pray, I always pray that she will know God's love, that she will know how loved she is. Um, it's the most tremendously important thing. And, and I, I grew up without that. And so I reflect on that in the book as well, um, because as a teenager, with if you take away God, and it can be a very, very lonely time, and you're up against so many negative influences um, in terms of music, in terms of alcohol and drugs and all that stuff, and it can become so nihilistic um, that we really have to make sure that our children have scripture inside them and prayers inside them so that those words come to their lips easily. Well, we are living in an age where I, I think the it, there's a certain cry that if we can't hear it, we're deaf, we're dumb. It, it It's that cry that, you know, I want to be seen, I want to be heard, but more importantly, I want to be known. Not only to be known, but to know, to who am I? Who do you see me as? And I think in that chapter on the, I am the handmaid of the Lord, that understanding our identity and who we are in relation to God. That, I mean, I think, I think that's key. And you do a beautiful job of just kind of fleshing that all out. Yeah, it's fascinating as a, as a parent, as parents will know, watching your child grow and seeing what's, you know, what's in them from the beginning and what, you know, seems to emerge. And, and especially with a child who's got two cultures like Flo, who's very Italian and very English. And that's, <laughs> that's been quite a journey. That's quite, that's quite a combination, actually. Yeah. And she really does have two personalities. It's, it's incredible. You know, she'll suddenly switch and she'll be talking to a dad and I'll think, whoa, she's, she's terrifying in Italian. <laughs> Um, and then you know and then as I say the the crucial thing is that um, to remember that we who we are with Christ you know we're called upon to to comfort and to console Christ and to console God which is such a beautiful thing because he chooses to need us and um, that's something that is so beautiful about Christianity is that you know when we go to church we're called upon to love him we, we, he, he, we're necessary to God because he chooses us to be necessary and that, that's so amazing yeah I think that understanding who we are and what we have a purpose yeah. and you again in the Annunciation a call to faith in a broken world you you bring th- that bridge between what 
may seem like a story in a book to some. We understand it as divine revelation, but that revelation needs to come to life. It needs to cross over a bridge, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think what you know, I, I'm a poet. I mean, I, I you know, was originally a poet and I work very much with, with you know, what you can see with image and, and with story. And I think with, you know, with most people, it's useful to have, you know, you look at scripture and, you know, the great truths, which are so beautiful. And then if you can kind of extrapolate out and you can, you can actually connect them to concrete stories in real life and the stories of the saints and just see how all that works. Because people are, are living examples of God's truth. And I think a really good example of that is um, Chiara Corbella, who I talk about in the book, who's the girl who died in 2012, and I'm sure is going to be a saint. And she had the most tragic life, um, and yet she was so joyful. And that that was something that really intrigued me. And and th- it was only through the writing of this book that I came to my my conclusions about why she was joyful. You know, by sort of reading around it and praying, and and you get to realize that through loving God and through prayer, you really do receive wisdom. Mm. You begin to kind of, you begin to see in a sort of heightened way, almost, almost with the eyes of God. I mean, not, but almost in a partial way with the eyes of God. And yeah, it's, it's beautiful and fascinating. And we're not a Eucharistic people if we don't believe in the power of transformation. And that's essentially what you're talking about is take what seems so ordinary, but when you unite it with that grace, it it, it changes, it's transformed. Well, that's right. Yeah. And that, I say, you know, sort of many times in the book, I, I, I talk about how um, we should never think of our, our stories as small and our pain as small, because it's all kind of, it's part of this pattern with Christ and with Mary. So, you know, what we go through in life, we can always find it in Christ's life and in scripture. Um, and so we always find comfort in that they, you know, God provided us with all of these different connections in our lives. And, um, and it's beautiful to, to join those dots. Again, this book is so much more it's so deep. I love it because well, when I say it's deep, for some people will go, Oh, I can't go near that. But because you are that poet, the images you use, the stories you use, you are, uh, you're helping us enter into mystery because each of our lives, I mean, we're all a mystery. I mean, oftentimes people refer to you and and you, and I'm sure this makes you blush as a mystic. Aren't we all called to go into that exploration of that mysterious encounter that we have? Absolutely. And, you know, every, every Eucharist is, is a mystical experience um, because it's, it's a miracle. And, and I think, Some people are gifted with experiencing different things. I think converts particularly, I mean, I know many converts and a lot of converts will talk about what they experience, um, which can be quite startling um, in in terms in mystical terms. But then the funny thing was that when I wrote Night's Bright Darkness, people contacted me and said, oh, I've experienced that, but I just wouldn't have known how to say it. And I thought that was really interesting. And I think there's more going on beneath the surface than people often let on. Ah, see, that's the key. What you're <laughs> doing for your daughter is you're giving her a vocabulary. You're helping her to see with the eyes and ears of the heart. And most of us who were brought into the faith, we were given the the mechanics. No one taught us how to drive. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's it's very true that um, in a sense, children, it seems to me they're not really taught to pray. And I know it's not something it's not like learning to drive a car in, in a way. But in another sense, we do need to know about the veil and about be told about listening and be told about the fact that you can't really make things happen in prayer. You can only prepare the ground. You know, it's, it's God. God will God will work when God deems it right that we do feel something or know something. Um, and I think those are things that, to me, that should be taught in catechism. And I don't know how it is in the States, but in Italy, that's not that's not gone near. I think there was this period, too, of course, in uh, they, they talk about formation, Christian formation, whether you're small or you're an adult. But there is that time where you encounter that kerygma, where you you know and you identify or you want to know more fully Jesus Christ. Okay. And then there's the catechesis. And that's when we teach and we form. But then, you know, once you say yes in the Annunciation, just like Mary, once you say yes, something happens. Ontologically, something happens to us. 
And that, like you said, the dance is going to be different for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. And that's just it. You see, even now, Flo will say to me, oh, well, I haven't had my big experience with God yet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I say, well, you know, you, you, you may, and no no one can say how it's going to be, but there's no question that he's there. And I've no doubt that he has something very particular prepared for her. Um, But it's, but of course, you know, everybody is different. We just, we just can't know. But the beauty is that because we're all the body of Christ, um, we have, you know, we all share experiences. I mean, I, I take great consolation from Teresa of Avila and, um, and um, Julian of Norwich, particularly. I mean, all these mystics and all the writings, they're all so wonderful. And they're all for all of us. I think one of the m- most beautiful lines, well, they're all, everything you write is, is absolutely exquisite. But you say towards the end, with the, let it be done to me according to your word, you say, these days when you feel lost, I try to explain that every moment of your life is an annunciation, though it may not be heralded by any visible angel, and you may be totally blind and deaf to its manifestation. Every day, every moment is a yes, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's crucial. Um, I I find it a crucial thought, you know, because as I say, as we said at the beginning, we so often slip back and become disheartened or you know discouraged or whatever it might be and you you have to constantly think actually I'm being called every moment I'm being called on you know it's not enough to kind of give up or to slip into mediocrity because we are constantly being called and and we have to give our consent and it's um we should never forget our guardian angel by the way oh yeah very important (laughs) they don't forget us thank god literally Sally I just Again, Annunciation, a call to faith in a broken world is so beautiful. You seem to have this wonderful relationship with the Blessed Mother. I'm waiting for the next book when you enter into all those mysterious moments where Mary just didn't understand. You know, (laughs) where finding in the temple to all those moments where you're not always going to understand everything. And sometimes you have to take time and just ponder. Yeah, really. And I think that but that's something we're losing. Well, we've lost <laughs> as mm-hmm. a culture. It, there's no pondering that goes on anymore. I mean, we're so quick. We're so quick to say and to publish and to tweet and to put on Instagram. And there, there is no pondering. And that's about contemplation. And that's, you know, if we, if we do ponder, that's about constantly looking at our own hearts and God in our hearts. And we've lost that so badly. I w- wish we had more time. But in closing, any final thoughts, Sally? Um, I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm so thrilled that, that the book's out there and I just hope that people, my, my fervent hope and prayer is that people will find it, you know, really useful and, and, a, and a consolation and that it will bring them to, to pray deeper and to, to look at uh, the Annunciation in a particular way because it's just such an amazing, amazing event. It really is, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it is, it's huge and I'm so glad that you've given it this air to breathe and give, and brought it out in the light even more beautifully for us to gaze upon. So Sally, thank you so much. Well, thank you. With Sally Reed, we've gone inside the pages of Annunciation, A Call to Faith in a Broken World. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation along with thousands of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com. And join us next time for Inside the Pages insights from today's most compelling authors.